you'll have to bear with me because my throat is really taking a bit of a hammering over the last few days, so I'm hoping that it won't give out um, this morning. I've learned two things yesterday. Uh, Dewey buns. Yeah, you know what Dewey buns are? Oh, I, I was told this was a Mennonite thing. It's a bit like, um, what are they like, Jared there? Where's Jared? Like a square donut with sugar on the top. Fabulous. And I also learned yesterday how copper wire was invented. Two Mennonites arguing over a penny. <laughs> uh, I don't know how true that is because actually I tell the same joke about Scottish people. It's two Scotsmen arguing over a penny. This morning we're going to think just a little about difference. So if you've got access to a Bible, grab your Bible, and we're going to go to, I think it's 1076, the page number, which should be John 11. Yep, 1076, John 11. And here's the story. We've been following this most of the week. So, Monday, I spoke a little about two people that influenced my life. And if you remember the story of Dr. Kelly, whose house I broke into, and how he eventually was the person that was responsible for me, leading me to Jesus. And the other person that influenced my life and changed my life forever was Jesus Christ. Simple as that. Day two, Tuesday, we were thinking together about the two Bethanies that we find in John 11, John 10, 40, John 11, and John 1, 28. Bethany means the house of affliction and how Jesus put himself with people who were the least, the last, and the lost. That's what he was doing and how we as a church in the UK, how my own church in Leeds have tried to put ourselves in the place where people are dealing with so many afflictions. Yesterday, we weren't here, but if you noticed, there was an online video that I managed to put up from John 11, dealing with the two loves that we find in John 11. And today, we're going to think just a little bit about the two sisters that we find in John 11. So we'll begin our reading from verse 17 at the foot of the page, entitled, Jesus Comforts the Sisters of Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary, she stayed at home. We'll finish the reading there. So this is, Jesus had been invited to come to uh, Bethany outside of Jerusalem. He had remained Bethany beyond the Jordan, working with those who were the least, the last, and the lost. He had delayed his coming to Bethany at Jerusalem for two days, and when he arrived, Lazarus is already dead. If you remember the story, you can read back into chapter, uh, verse 1, where Jesus gets this call to come because Lazarus is sick. And here in the passage, you've got Jesus coming to the village. You have one sister come and greet him, and one stays in the home. As the story unfolds in John 11, it's really clear that you've got one sister that is a verbal processor. If you know what that means, she, she, she thinks out loud. 
She's got to have a conversation in order to help her deal with life and think about things. The big questions of life have to be dealt with in a way that means that she has to talk about it. And it's really clear that in the story as well that you have another sister who is not a verbal processor at all. She deals with the things of life by thinking on her own about things. That's why she couldn't come and talk with Jesus. And the story goes on. They're so very different, these sisters. Uh, the Bible tells us, the New Testament, not just in John 11, but there's another point uh, about these two sisters in Bethany when Jesus comes and places himself in their home. He was there often. Remember the story of Martha and Mary, one bustling around the kitchen, trying to get things ready, and the other one sitting at the feet of Jesus. And one sister getting really upset that the other sister is sitting at the feet of Jesus when she should be in the kitchen helping me. It kind of tells us that these two sisters are really quite different. They have different outlooks on life. They come from a different place, even though they're part of the same family. But they're different. I don't know if you have brothers and sisters. I have a brother who's 11 years older than me, and he was different to me. I was the black sheep of the family. He was the one that did everything right and gained the approval of my parents. I was the one that did everything wrong and did not get the approval of my parents. I wonder if you come from a family where you have brothers and sisters who are very different to, to you. How do we do difference? Well, here's a little bit of a passage in John 11 that helps us to engage with the idea of difference. Generally, I'll tell you how I process differences. This is how I do it. I'm really happy for people to be different than me, but I secretly hope they will become like me. Yeah? We do difference that way, don't we? Well, I'm really happy if you have a different view, but I will do everything in my power to change your opinion. That's how we do difference. We, we don't really do difference at all. We actually just hope that people become like us. There's a fantastic quote by a great... Um, person that writes about spirituality. He comes from the Benedictine tradition, and he's a man called Henry Nouwen. And you may have heard of Henry Nouwen, and I'm going to bring a quote to you from Henry Nouwen that kind of helps us engage with this passage. As you read on in this passage, it's very clear that two things are happening in this passage. One is hospitality, Jesus is on the receiving end of Martha and Mary's hospitality. He's been invited to their home once more. Another thing that's happening in this passage is listening. And Jesus listens to both these sisters, one who is in the home but who eventually comes and she can't say anything apart from weep. And this sister that comes first of all you can't be quiet and has to talk. There's something about Jesus listening to these two sisters. Here's the quotation from Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen says about hospitality that hospitality isn't about eating or drinking. It's not about what we get at hotels or coffee shops. That isn't hospitality at all. Hospitality is giving space and time as a gift in order that those who receive it may become fully themselves. Sounds a bit of a flowery language. Hospitality isn't a matter of food or drink, but is given as a gift in order for those who receive it, they have space and time to become truly themselves. The thing that makes sense to me in that 
I can count on the one hand the amount of times I've really been given that gift. Because the majority of times I am living up to someone else's expectation of me. And so I conform. I'm not truly given the gift of Graham becoming Graham. And this is true for you too. When are you ever really allowed just to be you? Wow, what a gift. And to be loved, not for what you bring to the table, but just because who you are. What a precious thing that is. Here's Henry Nowen helping us connect with this passage today. A number of things happen in the passage. Jesus listens really carefully to these two sisters. He does something else. They're so different, but he does something with them. He listens and he tells them the truth. He doesn't hold back from telling truth in the midst of their differences. Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker. But peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is made on the anvil of conflict. Here in the passage, we've got conflict. (laughs) There's trauma in the midst of this suffering that this family is undergoing these two sisters are trying to deal with it. Difference. I want to tell you a story, and I like stories. Who likes stories? I like stories, me. A couple of years ago, uh, I was invited to a Romanian church in Leeds, just round the corner from my own church. And the pastor of the church said, would you come and speak in our church. And I said, well, where, where is it? I didn't even know there was a Romanian church around the corner. And so he gave me the address and I said, but that's a house. That's not a church building at all. And he said, oh no, we, we meet in the house. And I said, well, how many actually meet in, in the church? And he said, oh, about 60 of us. 60 each time we have a sitting. Sorry? Each time you have a sitting, what do you mean? Well, the house is so small and our congregation is so big, we have to take it in turns who sits in the front room and hears the sermon. So when the sermon's over, all the people who have just heard it get up and move to the outskirts of the building and allow the other people to come in and the sermon is run again by the pastor. Okay, so how many times do do you hear the sermon Or does the pastor have to deliver the sermon? About four or five times in one evening in order to get through the people that would want to hear it. Oh, I've never been in quite a church quite like that before. He said, there's there's roughly between 60 and 80 of us, but the front room is so small. Um, Would you come and, and bring God's word to us? I said, I'd be delighted to do so. So I went to the church house, actually, And there in the front room, a really small front room, people were sitting three abreast from the walls, all round. And I'm in the middle. People are sitting this close. Three to the wall, three to the wall, three to the wall, three to the wall. And I'm I'm preaching. And the pastor said to me, Graham, people in the West have got a reputation of being very brief when they preach. Please do not be brief. (laughs) Oh, I felt immediately at home. I thought this was going to be a great experience. And I preached and they loved it. And when I got to the end of my sermon, they said, what every preacher loves to hear, have you got some more? (laughs) So I went again, I gave them a bit more. So here's the rub. This group of people a Roma Gypsy Romanians. Roma Gypsy Romanians, the 
the, the culture of Roma gypsies is that they have been hounded out of every single country in Europe. They have been persecuted so greatly that they are not welcome in many cities. And here they are on my front door in my community. When we get to the end of the service, the pastor takes me to one side and says, Graham, would there be any opportunity for us of meeting in your church building? And immediately I've got a conflict going on because I know the reputation of these people. I know what my church may think, well, even though we are quite, quite progressive, I know what they might think about having folks who are not like us in our building. So immediately we are thrown into a discussion about difference. I said to my church, and this was probably the 21st of December that we began these conversations. How can we with conscience say to this group of people, there's no room in the inn because it was just about Christmas. So we had them come and on their first meeting, 60. We had them for four years and they went from 60 to 500 in four years. They so outgrew our building that people, when I was invited to go and preach, people would be sitting in every available space, on the platform, under the lectern, they'd be sitting everywhere. They even bought 150 stools because there was no, not enough seating in the church building. They went out and bought 150 stools in order to sit on up and down the aisles. Our health and safety people in the church were going mental. <laughs> they were saying to me, Graham, you really need to go and have a word with this Roma church because if we have a fire, they'll all die because no one will get out. And I was reluctant and I said, look, I, I can't go and tell them they're doing something wrong when by all accounts they're doing things right. They're reaching out into the hearts of people's hearts and lives in our community that we wouldn't have a hope in hell's chance of reaching. Here's where the difference comes. The neighbors around the church began to be really quite upset and annoyed because every Tuesday night when they met for Bible study, anywhere between 350 and 500 people came. So all the streets were packed with cars. The local residents couldn't park their cars. There was no space left. Conflict began between the Romanian church and between our church and between our neighborhood. The conflict showed no signs of alleviating. There was differences of opinion. We had letters going back and forward from the local community to our church that went a bit like this. We don't trust these Romanians because we know that we turn our back, they'll steal everything in sight. So there was that level of discussion going back and forward and the bottom line, the issue wasn't the fact that they were Romanian. It was because they were different. How do we deal with difference? How do you deal with people who are different than you? They might have a different politic. They might have a different way of doing things. They might have a different understanding of the Bible. They might have a different outlook on life. How do you do difference? Uh, do you just tell people to be quiet and shut up and conform? Or do you allow people to have the space that Henry Nouwen says in order for them to dialogue and be completely themselves? We find Jesus in the passage dealing with two sisters, giving them space and time to talk to listen, and in all their discussions, it wasn't the absence of truth that helped them, 
because Jesus spoke the truth to each of them. He said the same thing to both sisters. I am the way, the tr- uh, I'm, sorry, I am the, I am the resurrection and the life. He spoke the same thing. How do you and I do difference? My church tries to engage with difference. We have 42 nationalities. We are people who don't believe the same things. We have people in our church who are hyper-evangelicals. We also have people in our church who are radical liberals. They're in the same place. We have people in our church who are, I'll give you a rundown, ex-Salvation Army, ex-Methodist, ex-Baptist, ex-Church of England, ex-Roman Catholic, ex-Orthodox. They're all in the same place, all at the same time, with so many opinions. They say of people in our church, with every two people, there's four opinions. It's that many opinions. How do you deal with difference? It becomes quite a thing when you have 42 nationalities. There's age differences in our church. The youngest person in our church is about six months old, and the oldest person in our church is 96. In fact, no, Marjorie's older than that. She's in her hundreds. How do you deal with the age difference? How do you deal with the ethnic mix? How do you deal with difference in theology? My goodness. I'm not asking you to think about something different than what you're doing. When I have been here in your school, one thing I've been impressed with that I've seen almost in every student, in every class I've gone into, in every welcome to sit at the lunch table, you guys really know how to do hospitality. Hospitality isn't about the food that you serve, but I've been so glad that you have given me the gift of sitting with each of you and becoming the person that I really am in front of you. I want to thank you for that because that is the most gospel thing you can do. That's the most Christ-like thing you can do. That's the most precious gift that you can give another human being. That helps us with difference to welcome and give hospitality and say, come and sit with me. And in doing so, you make and you give them the ability of being truly them. All sorts of different, disparate things I've just said. But go away with the question, how will I do difference in the midst of diversity? How will I do hospitality and welcome? How might I welcome the stranger into my friendship circles? How might I see someone who's different from me be welcome in my home, in my family, and in my church? Go away with those thoughts, think them through, and come up with an answer for yourself. We're going to pray And like we've done in previous mornings, if praying in this way isn't part of your tradition, if you come from another faith community, then perhaps you'd just like to pause for a moment while others pray. But if prayer is part of your Christian faith, I encourage you to pray with me. So let's bow our heads. Let's pause for a moment in the quietness. Lord Jesus, you were precious with Martha and Mary. You came into their lives that morning, that day. You were confronted with their different ways of dealing with the trauma that was unfolding in front of you. You gave them a listening ear. You welcomed their hospitality. And you told them truth. Lord, 
Lord, help each one of us in every relationship that we form and hold in our lives, not to damage another individual, but to hold them as precious and at the same time not let go of the things that are true for us. Lord, help us in that dynamic. For some of us are really good at justice and not very good at telling the truth when it comes to the gospel and doctrine. And some of us too, Lord, are really good at stating the case for Jesus and the gospel and are really not very good at doing justice. But Lord, we want them both. We want both these things. In Jesus' name, amen.